morning. Good morning. And I um, see there are a few people um, here on the call. If you feel like, you know, a bit adventurous, come on screen and we'll have a bit of a, um, you know, a very low key, uh, intimate space, space to have a bit of a conversation. Take it as that. How about that? Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Okay. All right. Uh, um, so uh, let me um, share a bit of my slide and talk you through uh, who we are and what we're doing here. So uh, can everybody see my screen? Yep. Yeah. Awesome. OK, so um, welcome, everybody. My name is Dee and I am um, from uh, NHS ML and I have my colleague um, Neil Sansom here and we've been approached um, to talk you through our um, our journey of setting up staff um, networks and um, particularly I'll hand it over to Neil to talk about the disabilities network. So before that let me just introduce both of us and who we are and um, you know um, how come we are here. So um, my name is Dean Ambiar. I am a people consultant and also Moonlights as a coach uh, in NHS ML. And um, I will hand it over to Neil. Neil, do you want to do your introduction? Yeah, sure. So I'm, I'm Neil Sanson. I'm uh, currently the chair of the Disability Staff Network. I'm also uh, within ML at the uh, technical project manager within IT. And I've been with the NHS just coming up about. 10 years now so wow uh, so so you, you you entering your teen phase then neil very soon yeah it's, it's <laughs> actually flown so i mean prior to that i did 15 years in local government um and also as well academic research so that took me all across Europe. So I've worked in Finland, Slovakia, Belgium, Germany um, on uh, IT projects for the EU. Um, always had a kind of an IT background to myself, but not technical as it's such. Um, so I'm not a techie person, more a project manager. So, um, so yeah, uh, my, my background is that um, I'm neurodiverse. So I've had di diagnosis for autism, currently going through a diagnosis for ADHD, and I have a partial diagnosis um, for dyspraxia. Uh, my son, uh, who I care for, um, he has Down syndrome. So uh, a lot of lived experience in terms of um, uh, uh, you know disabilities and also as well you know the reason why i wanted to get involved in what deal talk about is this uh, uh the, the 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 program of setting up a uh, disability staff network and we'll, but we'll we'll come on to that in a little bit absolutely absolutely um so just to give you a bit of um, who we are as ml um we used to be called uh, the commissioning support unit the middleton lancashire Com uh, commissioning support unit but we've had a bit of a transformation and have now become um, more of a consultancy organization and we have become a strategic partner um to a number of integrated care systems um so just just picking um uh, some facts and figures from um um, the screen. We are about 2,000 people strong now, and we do have a number of, um, you know, supply chain um, partners, including um, the strategic unit, the NHS Horizons, they all come under the umbrella of um, NHS ML. And um, we um, we also uh, lead on the Talent One um, Bank. If you've heard of, it's a bank of talent. Uh, if you've heard of them, and we've also mobilised the Gold Command uh, Room every time when the NHS is under pressure, we also facilitate that. So, and we are very much um, uh, involved in a number of digital transformation programs. So, a bit of um, organisational insight of who we are. Um, so. Um, we um, we want to present the origin story of creating a movement, um, and especially how um, around the staff networks. So you might have um, seen the NHS commitment um, to diversity and inclusion, 
But what stands out for me um, in, in the commitment is around we must and we will. And I understand there is um, a, a language of certainty in there, but it isn't as straightforward often. And when we talk about diversity and inclusion, it's all about the subtleties of what it is. So um, I would like to um, look at this quote where diversity alone is not enough. It is a, diversity is about inv being invited to a party. Inclusion is about asking to dance. So what it's essentially telling us uh, is that we can have a commitment to diversity, but it's often the subtleties, the environment that we create for inclusion to thrive that actually, you know, creates uh, the, for diversity to thrive in organizations. So with that, this is our journey so far. When I was tasked um, as of the 1st of January 2022 to create staff networks, I wasn't very sure what I was, what's going to happen or what I was getting into. So I started documenting my journey as we progressed. So um, to start with, there was a commitment by the organization um, to create staff networks and um, being an organization development practitioner, my initial thought is why? Why do we actually need staff networks? So that's exactly where we started is asking the question why. So if you are familiar with the Golden Circle principle, the Golden Circle um, by Simon Sinek often starts with the why. Why do we do what we do? We then go into how we do the why and then what are we doing? So that's exactly the principle we followed here is why are we wanting staff networks? And there was so much research to say that when there is genuine connection in uh, within people, um, there is a movement and that movement is the energy behind achieving bigger and greater things. Um, so um, what we did at this initial stage when there was no staff, staff networks was put out a commitment statement as to why is ML wanting to set up staff um, uh, networks. And that was an, uh, like a declaration statement to our people as to why uh, we think uh, staff networks is a great idea. But we wanted to float this idea wider to see if there is a genuine appetite in the organization for staff networks. Um, so before we went into that um, gathering um, intelligence from people or understanding if there was a genuine appetite for staff networks, we needed organizational leadership commitment. So it was about making sure that our house is in, is in order, or if I can put it as a metaphor, making sure that the soil is fertile so that the, the plant can grow. So this was about... Um, you know, getting leadership commitment from the organization, briefing them about the resources that will take for staff networks to establish and thrive, um, finding ex uh, exec sponsors who could be voiced um, in the exec board for staff networks. So there was a lot of groundwork before we even started, um, you know, putting it out there about, um, you know, our commitment to staff networks. So following on from that, it's all about the buzz. Uh, it's so important to create noise uh, when you're starting a movement because you're trying to understand if there is a genuine appetite. And um, the biggest thing was to maximize the comms channels, um, utilize them. I had a number of uh, conversations with stakeholders, whether that be staff side, the freedom to speak up, associate directors, champions from other staff networks. So because we, it was a time when we were just coming out of COVID, there was other staff networks like um, the health and wellbeing, the mental health uh, network, um, they were strong and, and, and already in function. So it was consulting them uh, around what is the appetite for um, staff networks around ethnic diversity, um, include um, disability and LGBTQ. We then um, thought it's important for our organization to see what great staff networks look like so that uh, we understand 
um, the appetite for um, networks in our organization. So that led to the design of the staff network design event, which I'll come to in the next slide. Uh, we also uh, created an expression form earlier on so that as and when uh, people are uh, aware of it and they're interested, they have a form that they can fill in to show an interest when our staff networks are up and functioning that you can, you know, you're interested to join it. So that's something that we did earlier on. So as um, with regard to the staff network design event, now um, I think there was almost an expectation by uh, from me to sit in my drawing board and 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 create um, uh, a structure for staff networks um, at my desk. Now that wouldn't be practicing what I preach. Um, if we are trying to create an inclusive space, we want it to be a co-production of whatever we're creating. So it's so important for people, interested parties to come together to create that space. So um, we did a host a staff network design event where we invited speakers from outside the organization who have so much um, experience, expertise um, in the space, but also um, who can give us a brilliant picture of what great looks like. What does great staff networks look like? What do they feel like and what do they achieve? What are the tangibles that they can bring? Um, so we invited Nahid Nasir um, and she um, was leading the inclusion unit at the Northern Care Alliance. She's a brilliant speaker. I have um, um, seen her um, before and she is very inspirational. So she was one of the speakers who came to the event. And we had a design event. So we went through what do we want our staff network, starting with the vision, uh, mission and values of our staff, staff network. So from that, we understand that people want a inclusive space. So earlier on, we knew that our staff net network wouldn't be an exclusive space in the sense like even if it says um, ethnic diversity network, everybody is invited to join the network and irrespective of um, because often there is an unsaid um, assumption that ethnic diversity is a brown black space. Um, so we didn't we want to dismantle it immediately to say that it's an inclusive space. As long as you are interested, no more you are invited. And so is the disability network and the LGBTQ network. All our networks are is an inclusive space. So that was on the get go. Um, that event created a, a lot of buzz um, within the organization around staff network. And that is also when we met um, Neil uh, for the very first time in that event. I remember very clearly this becomes very significant later on in the in the origin story because I'll, I'll come to that in a minute. Um, but on that day, we do, did something called the pledge wall, which was what is that one tiny um, thing that you could do from the event today to to, uh, you know, to further uh, your commitment to the staff network, whatever be it. It could be that you can share an article around a staff network with somebody who is interested so that they know about a movement like that. So what is that one tiny step that we can take in this direction? So with that is uh, we've come to the leadership search. Now we know that staff networks can only thrive if there are passionate people behind the movement. And this is where Neil becomes incredibly significant for me, is that it's at the design event that we met and I was so immediately caught on about the passion that he brings um, to, to this. And um, I put out, a, when I put out a leadership search for the staff networks, um, I, um called Neil and said are you applying for this and I remember the conversation we had and when he said I don't think I I, I am set up for this I don't think I, I I don't I don't know whether I am leadership material and that's quote unquote what he's told me and probably the most consistent leader I've ever seen um <laughs> so uh, it goes to show is that sometimes we we have we have these labels and that labels come with baggage until somebody comes and says, um, 
I know you have it, uh, you know, just 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 apply and we will provide you with all the background support you need um, to get started. And that was our initial conversation. And now here it, it is, Neil, as the chair of Disability Network. So that is how we found most of our um, leaders for all the other staff networks from casual conversations, people who've expressed interest. And if you were in doubt, we 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 helped. We knew immediately we are there isn't a type of leader that we are looking for. Um, the only requirement was that you have the passion um, to to take this further. So um, following on, it's so important for a staff net for a staff network to survive, to have strong voices backing it. And that's how the exec sponsor became so important. So I put it out as an opportunity for um, senior, super senior leaders in our organization who have some weightage, um, who have the voice around the exec board as an opportunity that they can support. So it wasn't that we could use support us. It is that we 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 are establishing this is an opportunity if you want to support us. And we have three incredible um, exec sponsors who are incredibly passionate, um, uh, who then joined us as exec sponsors adding more gravitas to the staff networks. So um, we once we have the leader, we have um, a leadership commitment from the organization. We also have the exec um, sponsors. Now your, the staff networks are taking structure and shape. So we did the in introductory meetings where int introduced everybody. We created a bit of a vision setting uh, action planning exercise where we're creating what does what's the vision you know where do we want to get in 12 months time so that that exercise will guide the activities of the staff networks so initially as you can imagine the first um uh, the, the vision was how do we create meat and bones for the staff networks how do we create um you know more um structure so and how do we increase the staff membership uh, network membership etc so th those were the discussions in the earlier meetings uh we promoted the launch so we set the dates for the launch of the staff networks and we heavily promoted it through our um uh, comms channels. Now, who, the gentleman that you see on uh, screen is Sam Gover, who is the exact sponsor um, for the Disabilities Network. And I did an interview with him uh, around, um, you know, his passion in this area and what he brings to the table. Uh, with that, we launched the three networks um, uh, one after another. It was a very busy month for me. Um, and with that, the Disabilities Network was launched on the 20th of July 2022. Um, we had a celebratory event, a two hour event, um, virtual event. Um, where we introduced Neil as the chair to the network. We also introduced exec sponsor Sam Gover. We did a vision setting exercise for the people who joined our network. We did an um, introductory um, session around ableism, the concept of ableism. And we also um, brought um, Sana, who is external to the NHS, who works as a lawyer, um, but she's visually impaired. And so we, we we brought a personal story where she talked about her challenges and she's incredibly inspirational and um, that is how we launched the disabilities network. Um, I'll let Neil speak more about the nitty gritties of the disability network but with um, after the launch of the staff network what is now important is we have created a lot of hype a lot of noise a lot of interest in people we've got people joining the staff network so how do we keep the momentum going part of that was making sure that our leaders had the right support so we ensured that they um, linked in with training programs and mentors out there um, in the wider nhs so that they get the support they needed we also uh, established or in the process of establishing reporting structures, governance structures, so staff networks have official voices. We also found budgets uh, that could support the network. And we also started uh, creating informal, um, you know, softer uh, influence. Uh, and part of that initiative was the Human Library Series. 
So the Human Library series is a blog um, that where we have interview um, or stories, personal stories of people around, uh, you know, it could be um, what makes them human. Um, so and hence it's called Human Library Series. So uh, it could be a cultural piece, you know, how do you celebrate, um, probably how do you celebrate Diwali? Or it could be around uh, a disability and your story through it. Um, it could, could be about um, all kinds of um, stories that make you human. And it was a huge success. We now um, um, still have human uh, library series um, feature in our organization. Um, and uh, I think they called under a different name now. Um, so with that, I'll um, pass it on to uh, Neil to give us more information about his experience as a chair for Disability Network. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Dee, for, for, for that and that, that, that run through. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll I'll talk about the um, <clears throat> I guess really the kind of the journey that we've been on for almost like the past two years now. I think our first meeting was around about the October of twenty two. Um, but along that journey, um, there's a great deal of things that we've done, a lot of um, activities, a lot of things that we still need to do, many things that we still need to look at and try and try and improve and get right. So I'll take you through that. Um, and then at the end, um, there's going to be an opportunity for, for, for questions. So, um, so um, initially sort of installed as, 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 as chairperson, um so as part of the development of the network all the network chairs uh, including myself we were um uh, matched up with a uh, network chair development program that was put on by nhs england in in birmingham and that was over a period of about five months something like that so i think it was about sort of alternate months that we'd, we'd, we'd meet up in Birmingham and go to a conference facility. Really good program uh, that NHS England had, had just developed, really, I think. And I think they're still continuing with that. Um, so if you, um, you, you you have a look on the, um, uh, the the relevant website, I think there's information available on there as to how you can join uh, future programmes. And I believe they are still, still running them. Um, so that's um development program was 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 really really useful um going back to what Dee said earlier is I, I i had to be persuaded in the end uh and very nicely uh, it was too about taking up that position of network chair um because you say people have their own um perceptions about what leadership is um you know the, it's, it's it's not about that you know it's not about seniority it's about you know uh leading a group of individuals to to achieve a certain goal or objective um and i'll be honest i didn't feel i was that sort of material um how wrong was i um i think you know from persuasion as to kind of reconsider that and sort of take up the position um it's something that it's probably one of the best decisions I've, I've i've made personally and professionally um you know you have to have to you know perhaps maybe lacking in a little bit of confidence at the time but i would say yeah great decision that i've made um received lots of great support and i guess really just sort of if you are presented with these opportunities just have a go um you know um put put the fear aside you can either do not do it or you can do it scared i, I chose the latter and the, the you know the fear kind of drops away you have great people around you you build your confidence and yeah it's just been a really really good experience for me so you know thank you thank you d for persuading me to to to, uh, to to take up the position um so in in, in terms of what we were doing in those, those early stages the latter half of 2022 we're establishing the network so monthly meetings were set up we'd got information on our staff intranet called nugget so uh, as d said trying to create that buzz around internally around it 
uh, and also as well creating our own Microsoft Teams site where members could uh, come together, we could post information, share information, minutes, agendas, reports, any kind of materials that we think were kind of relevant to, to the network. We've got our own space there uh, as a network to, uh, to, to, to use and use as a platform to, uh, to, 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 to launch and support ourselves. Um, over the period, we've we've had external speakers in. We've had some really really great people come in. So, um, had a director from a consultancy construction consultancy called WSP. Um, they're doing a lot of work on um, uh, designing the built environment um, uh, in mind for HS2. Uh, obviously, a huge huge project. Um, but that was really, really interesting as to how they're going about thinking about um, making sure that disabilities are considered, you know, not just physical, uh, uh, but also hidden disabilities as well. Um, some really, really kind of fascinating work and how also that extends into the general rail sector so something perhaps you know most people wouldn't have kind of thought about but it was some really kind of fa uh, fascinating insights we had an absolutely brilliant um external speaker from um uh lincolnshire united hospitals trust um um setting up of their disability network so like ourselves you know we were just starting on that journey but they'd started on that possibly two years prior to that and again i think you know from 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 meeting up with that everyone was very kind of inspirational and everyone saw okay well we could be that in two years time and i think that was the you know the passion that uh, that came through from from yvonne who gave that that presentation she was only about five um but you know sort of uh enthusiasm and passion and drive beyond her years um you know and i think that really kind of lit a fire every under everyone and going yeah we could do this um and you know we're we're, we're a good way to, to 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 on that journey as well so you know we look back and go yeah we, we we've done really really well here um something as i did as chair was straight off we identified well what are the the, the members priorities um something i've always said is you know I, I'm, I'm just a head on a stick who turns up every month and tries to kind of shepherd people in the direction but really in terms of what the you know what we want to do, what needs to happen in terms of the network that is defined by the members so we did a piece of con uh, consultants internal consultation all right okay what is it that you want to do as network what are the burning issues that you experience or know of out in the uh, or, or perceive of that are out in the organization i think we came up with about 30 odd just over 30 priorities they were then sort of documented and then uh, a further little piece of consultation on that well okay if you're going to pick three which ones are they what what would you focus on what's going to have the biggest impact what's important to you um so we then gave ourselves some sort of direction around what what we wanted to kind of move forward with. Um, just around 12 months ago, um, we gave a presentation as all the networks to our uh, the MLCSU board. Um, and that was really, uh, really good because um, we, we got ha had a great deal of uh, feedback. Um, they recognised the challenges and the support that we needed. Uh, and pretty much well, everything that we asked for, we got. Um, you know, so dedicated time out of our, um, uh, our our working months, you know, two days a month as a chair to be able to work on these sort of things. Um, we secured budgets for each network so we could actually do things. So whether it was like creative materials, booking speakers, going to conferences, those sort of things. So um, really, really kind of backed um, in, in terms of um getting that kind of top cover uh, which is really really important where you're looking at something as important as this um there was also as well the appointment of an edi board advisor so um uh, they've been in place um since uh, around about this time last year and they um provide advice to our, our board our board has gone through a little bit of a a change recently i'll get onto that um you know, shortly but the other thing that, that happened was it was as the the network was growing there was the need for a vice chair 
so Helen, who's not on the call today, um, Helen Graham, um, she provided some really kind of uh, important support to, to me and also as well in the early part of this year. Um, making sure that, you know, we, we, we can kind of share the load a little bit, um, does get busy, does get demanding. And also as well, you know, like, you know, in my, in my previous role, um, there was a finance element to it. And as we all know, the final quarter and the first quarter of every year are always really, really busy, you know, trying to get sort of, um, uh, you know, getting the accounts settled and closed. And that took up a, a you know a lot of time, so we had to kind of share the load a little bit there, and that was really really crucial. Um, I've mentioned about the budget; we've got two k per year that we can spend. Um, so again, we've got that, but it's a little bit lower this year. I think it's one point five, but still a good amount of money that we can do something with. And then other other things that we were doing throughout the year was promoting ourselves. So um, we got uh, something that we did last year, and I think. D, were you sort of partly involved with that? But I think it was more sort of one of our colleagues, Sarah West. Every year we have a leadership conference that we, we, we hold. This year it was at Stoke City Football Ground. And all the leaders within the organisation, not about kind of seniority. You know, you could be, you know, a band five and you're leading a small team of, you know, um, uh, support analysts on a service desk, you know, come together and how, how can you be a better better leader learn from others experience so we had stalls at that conference each of the networks promote our work engage with people interesting time in that you know you're returning from covid not really seeing people for a, for a while but also as well just to kind of see the whites of people's eyes and sort of you know Get, get to see them. That was a really, really good experience. And that gave all the networks a bit of a kind of a boost and a lift in terms of, of, of membership. We're continuing to publish articles on our, um, uh, our intra intranet about um, staff members' lived experience. So uh, next month we've got uh, Disability Pride Month and I'm in the process of uh, writing a, a lived experience about my experience around being diagnosed as autistic uh, or having autism. Um, something I didn't really expect at the beginning of this year. Um, something very very surprising so um a journey that's taken place really over about the past two and a half years so uh, something around this you know um slight di diversion in that it's really really important to talk to others about your experience uh, my build up to this was particularly traumatic um it wasn't a nice journey to coming to that point to saying oh okay i might be autistic here um just by being open and talking about these sort of things um from from what i went through personally i wouldn't want another person to go through that at all and it's a it's a big big thing that's coming out within organizations with people having you know late diagnosis of hidden disabilities it's a huge, huge challenge for those individuals and also as well for organisations like the, uh, the NHS. You know, we need to be ready and prepared to support those staff when they put their hand up and say, I need help and support here. Absolutely crucial. Um, and, you know, we need to be ready and prepared for that. But we, you know, as networks and as colleagues and as managers, we need to be able to support those individuals when they, 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 they do put their hand up and say, look, I need help here. I'm struggling X, Y, Z. Um, also, as well, some of the projects that we, we, we did last year. Um, so we initiated a review of our digital content across our digital platforms to make sure that they were accessible. Um, so um, that piece of work has started 12 month piece of work to review things like PDFs, pages, web pages, websites across our, um, our, our various channels to make sure because we as an organization we have a public sector um objective or requirement that our content has to be accessible you know and just because it's on an intranet doesn't mean that it gets you out of that a member of staff has just as much right as a member of per public to be able to have their content in dig have digital content in an accessible format. So that's a piece of work that's ongoing at the moment. And at the beginning of the year, um, I had to take a little bit of a sabbatical from the network and Helen, who uh, I, I spoke about earlier, took over 
clues to say, you know, very busy final quarter, found out that I was moving into a different team on the 1st of April, so I had to do a lot of handover and prep work. So Helen was really, really great in there. But what she started off with our director of culture, Victoria, um, was starting to look at reasonable adjustments and access to work. Um, feedback that we've been getting was that there were some, re some real problems in the organisation about the understanding of the access to and the interpretation of what reasonable adjustments are, um, you know, um, how to go about it, the processes, the clarity, some real, real problems around the, the, the processes there getting so far through it and then having to start over it all over again because you're engaging with other individuals also as well with access to work. You know, DWP were involved with that, trying to get people back into work, getting support that they need, all those sort of things. So it became fairly obvious that that wasn't supporting our staff, that managers didn't really know what they were doing properly um, and that they were not being supported as well mistakes being made so we've got an ongoing piece of work at the moment fairly substantial around looking at the one thing d that i've missed off here that was major la last year was um modernizing recruitment so um a big big piece of work that was done was to look at how do we go about doing inclusive recruitment as an organization what are we doing well what aren't we doing so well um so that is in the process of being implemented so things like one of the examples was you know um the interview process was very much skewed in and uh, towards neurotypical individuals however by making some changes such as provide all candidates in advance with the questions for the interviews that gives everyone the ability uh, and the opportunity to be able to be their best individual uh, and, and present as well as they can within that um, uh, within that interview environment um, you know what we're finding was that um, neuro neurodiverse individuals were being uh, disadvantaged as part of that process so again that's another kind of piece of work that's going on um, uh, at the moment. So uh, next slide, please. So what are we planning to do? So this is kind of fairly kind of hot off the press. So last week we had um, uh, a network chairs meeting with three uh, with our director of HR, director of culture, and one of our direct champions uh, for the for the networks. Uh, and, and what we've sort of set out and agreed is, you know, well, what what is it that we want to do this year? What what what, what is it that you know? If we we sort of look back and go, okay, yeah, we 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 do these i think it'll be a good year so first one is we want to grow the ne the network membership uh and we want to do that in a number of different ways so buying by being open more open so at the moment we have our network meetings um you have to be a member of the network to be able to attend that however what we're looking at doing is with our team site and those network meetings is it being open to anyone and everyone so um we will still have our team site, um, but we we go to open that up, but we're still going to keep a kind of, say, a private channel for members on there who if they want to discuss anything in private or anything like that. So growing the network, really want to do that. Feeling is that there are people who perhaps don't want to engage in a network environment, but they do, you know, they do want to kind of sit in the background, contribute in the background. And, you know, we've got to kind of, respect that you know uh, we haven't got to be gatekeepers of all this kind of stuff um we're looking at building strong links um with our other csu networks there's a slide later on we'll just come on to about how different issues and themes overlap um also as well by working together on different things um that will help us in terms of capacity strength uh, and also as well kind of a mutual understanding as well um so you know the more we can talk and shout about these sort of things you know the the, the more understanding there'll be the more in uh, you know appreciation and hopefully the better the change um we're going through as well um a change in terms of governance so although we're sort of in established you know, approaching kind of two years we're still kind of feeling our way around how to get things done 
uh, but also as well in the context of we've been going through quite a bit of organisational change. So there's been multiple um, uh, management of change uh, activities going on over the past couple of years. We got to the end of one fairly recently and then we've um, we've been told that we're not merging, but we're going to be working. Uh, ML is going to be working a lot closer with the three other CSUs. So we've got a period of change coming up with that. So what we're thinking about there is, OK, can we link up with the other um, uh, the other CSU staff networks? So what can we learn from then? Uh, can we cooperate on things? Can we get bigger and better kind of bookings in terms of the presenters who come to us? They don't come cheap. So can we share budgets? What can we do to, you know, Work, work together, share the resources and have a bigger and better impact. Um, so we're going through um, some, some change at the moment with some governance. And what we are saying we want to do is have some real lasting and ch uh, 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 change uh, uh, and, and effect there. Um, we're also about to start reconsulting on uh, our members' priorities. So we're doing a number of different initiatives. Uh, people have got kind of comfortable with you know, various things that have gone on. We've gone through management of change. That may very well have thrown up some, some issues for groups and individuals and with managers as well. We're looking by the end of the year to have achieved the web content access, accessibility guidelines accreditation for our online content by the end of the year. And also as well, we're going through a number of different promotional events. So next month, Disability Pride Month, we're going to be having a committee for Disabilities History Month, which takes place spanning November and December. We've got the leadership conferences happening again in November. And something we want to do as well is a, a network day, get all the networks together and go between our different sites, do it virtually, um, really kind of have run just digital channels for, for us to be engaged, uh, for staff to engage with. You know, we can have sort of days, you know, something I thought about the other day is, wouldn't it be great if we sort of have a, have a day at the office, maybe got someone in from uh, Royal Institute, the National Institute for the Blind, and they can bring a guide dog in you know, uh, really try and engage with people that way in different ways, you know, um, really start thinking creatively about how we can work and engage with, with individuals. Um, I've mentioned about opening up our, our, our team sites where we, uh, we and staff can uh, collaborate. Also, sort of looking at booking, you know, uh, uh, more, more speakers, so authors, charities, influencers, um, you know, the, the, the influencer area. If you go on places like Instagram, there's some really, really great kind of um, people out there who, who do some really, really great content and have, you know, provoke some excellent kind of um, thought and conversation uh, around these sort of things. Uh, we're looking at doing a lot of internal presentations, so going to department and directorate meetings um, to raise awareness of what we do, how we can help them and managers, um, uh, and, and, and really rather than wait for people to come to us, go to them, start the conversation. Um, also as well, looking at uh, cross-cutting areas. So um, we're going to be working uh, and presenting with our Freedom to Speak Up champions, um, so one of the areas that we think there might be some benefit of engaging around is, um, like yourself, you probably have ESR where you record your, uh, if you have any kind of disabil uh, disabilities, you can record them on there. What we do believe is that that is significantly underreported. Why is that? Um, maybe freedom to speak up, have a role to help us and the organisation understand, well, what are those challenges? What is it that people feel reticent about? Is it the, you know, they record the information, it's going to be used against them? Or is it that if they put the information there, they know that they're not going to get the support of their manager or the organisation to get those reasonable adjustments? So looking at that really good area that we want to try, try cross working on. Uh, and the other one as well is, Sunflower scheme, um, something I've always personally wanted to kind of introduce. Um, it's not just about the lanyard, but it's also about as well as about that organisation providing a lot of corporate support and information to help organisations, managers and individuals with that. So a big area of that, you know, is and if you, you know, 
go, go and have a look at their site, but just go and have a look at the number of hidden disabilities. You know, it's not just about, you know, neuro, neurodiversity. There's a huge, huge number of um, uh, disabilities within there. And it's something, you know, we're looking at working with our unions, uh, our staff representation unions about, about how can we help better educate our managers around helping them understand what these conditions, you know, these disabilities are and how they can help. Um, and not just by doing a kind of a one size fits all approach. You know, we have to treat you know staff as individuals, and their needs, uh, one individual's needs, are completely different from another. So it's not just you know giving a standard response that ticks a box. We, you know, we can't do that. It's got to be a conversation and a very tailored and specific support. So yeah, sunflower scheme. Again, a lot of cross-purpose areas that we can sort of work, work on. Um, next slide, please. So, yeah, this is just an example of, you know, how we feel our networks are interlinked across the organisation. So, you know, the ethnic diversity there. So, you know, you've got the three, um, you know, the marginalisation, discrimination with, you know, disability and LGBTQ+. So with a lot of the hidden disabilities and late diagnosis, um, the conversations that, you know, I've had with other individuals and for myself, it's very much like you're presented with that and there's the realisation that, oh, I'm neurodiverse and I have a different persona now. Uh, or I potentially I'm not the person I thought I was. How does that kind of relate to coming out in terms of LGBTQ plus? So there's some really interesting conversations to be had around these sort of themes. And this is why I said on the previous screen, really kind of working together across the different networks and having those conversations and, you know, sharing those life experiences, those lived experiences as well. We, we have a lot to learn from each other. Um, so next slide, please. Um, I mentioned about our governance. So as an organisation for EDI, we're making some changes at the moment, and these are going to be coming in um, shortly. So our board has shrunk. Uh, it's a much smaller board. I think there's six individuals on it now. A lot of the decision making around EDI uh, and um, uh, the projects uh, and the accountability is going to sit in our poor performance delivery group. Um, all the chairs and the um, champions will sit as permanent members on an EDI subgroup, and that's to hold the performance and delivery group to account on uh, the progress with um, the EDI plan and boards. EML board is really more of a kind of a rubber stamping kind of forum, uh, not really where a lot of the conversation debate takes place. It's it's so we, we, we're kind of making changes around this to make sure that, you know, we're more effective and we can drive through the changes that we want. There's also as well going to be an EDI communities of practice uh, that sits below the, the EDI subgroup. Uh, and there you'll have the um, the, 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 the ethnic, disability and LGBTQ plus staff networks. There is also as well an EDI, EDI professional network that's going to be set up. So what as an organisation and consultancy that we do is we do a lot of really great um, work with NHS organisations um, around implementing these sort of things. So different parts of the, our organisation do that. And what we want to do is bring those together um so um they know what we're doing we know what they're doing and we can have a more of a kind of a conversation around the professional services that we we offer one thing that isn't on there and it's mentioned on the uh the, the list there we are in the process of setting up a health and well-being network um because again this kind of ties together some of the um other activities of the network so that could be things around uh, depression, anxiety, caring, um, general health, working from home, these sort of things. So thinking that, yeah, that health and well-being space provides our networks and also as well the organisation to come together in a more relaxed uh, activity, uh, 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 activity space. Um, 
We're also as well looking at working with other CSU networks, as I've spoken about, and also as well potentially setting up uh, regional chair networks. So bringing together the chairs across the NHS on a, a periodic basis and go, what have you been doing? How have you been doing? Rather like what we're doing today. Um, next slide, please. So what have we learned? So the key points, um, it's got to be member led. Um, they identify the issues, the challenges, the priorities. So as I mentioned, I'm just here as a, as a head on the stick to try and, you know, make sure that, you know, give people direction and uh, get the support in place and um, try and help solve their problems. Um, it's not easy. It is hard work. Um, it's um, you do have to balance the energy. Um, you know, you, you, you know, everyone has day jobs, um, as we know in the NHS, a lot of demand on services and time. So, the more kind of people that you can get involved to support you in the network is absolutely crucial. It's patience, it's not going to happen over time. Um, when I came into this, I had lots of ambition and thought, yeah, we can do this, we can do that. And it doesn't happen like that. It takes time to build traction and momentum. Um, relating to that, ambition versus resources. Personally, I could do this every day of the week and I still wouldn't be done. Um, so you have to kind of go, right, we can't do everything. Um, so let's kind of be realistic and go back to the, the priorities and go, right, okay, what is it that we want to do? If someone pops up and says, yeah, I'd really, really like to do that. By all means, let them run with it, you know, but, you know, see if you can, what you can do to support them in terms of subgroups or committees or anything like that. See what you can do to try and support that. Working together. So, you know, not being, um, you know, working across those networks, the cross-cutting themes, um, inviting, you know, your other networks, having joint meetings. That's something I did earlier in the year. Um, we didn't quite have enough for a, a, an agenda. So we had a joint agenda, you know, and there was that understanding between there. Try and think out the box. So, again, from the very beginning, what we didn't want is to be gatekeepers on all of this. You know, we don't want to be, you know, it's not just because you're a member you can attend. If you're an ally, if you're a manager, you're just interested, you're welcome. Um, and that's the way that we're going to be able to kind of spread the messages, the challenges, the understanding, the appreciation of being able to uh, achieve the change. And the final one there is top cover and governance. Get that right, get your support, Getting that top cover and support from your senior leadership is absolutely crucial. What you don't want is those senior leaders doing this because they think they're going to look good. That's entirely the wrong thing to do. It needs to be done because they believe and they're passionate about it, because otherwise it will just sort of be come across very, very hollow, very quickly. And it's it'll be spotted very, very quickly. So get the right people involved, get that passion, keep on at them as well, you know, uh, keep that momentum going with them. Um, next slide, please. So um, taking a little bit longer than I would, would, would have hoped, but are there any questions for both me and, and Dee? One thing, Sorry, I should. <laughs> it's OK, Diane. <laughs> <laughs> One thing um, I do, I am concerned about is, um, is that I work part time um, in part because of my disability. So I only work 18 hours a week. I work from home. So it's um, it concerns me the amount of time I, I work in a reasonably uh, good position in finance but it does get provide some demands and it's it's the time it takes to do these things I have the passion but you know I can't fit extra hours in when they aren't there so I wonder what advice you'd give me for that or whether you feel I should step back and be more of a supporter and um, rather than trying to make this happen 
for my <laughs> particular hospital? Um, big lessons for me, and this is over the past 12 months. Number one, put yourself first. Um, I um, The other kind of link to that is that um, if you can spot the signs early enough that you're going to struggle or will be struggling, put your hand up. Uh, and again, this goes back to having that kind of support above yours in terms of the network. So if you've got a network champion. So December last year, I, I found out that I was going to be moving jobs. Um, the, the final quarter I, I, in my team, I do, you know, do all the kind of the pipeline income in my previous team making sure that we've got all the kind of the invoicing done we've got the payments that have come in and they're on the on our finance system and always and that 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 court is always really really stressful so layered that with i've got to hand over literally everything that I, I i do the business processes all those sort of things i just knew it would be a really, really stressful time so it's good to have in in the sense that i've got that not luxury but i could call upon them having a deputy chair so the more people you can sort of get involved with it great but the number one is you put yourself first you can't do everything and it shouldn't affect your health the kind of the rewind to that is the reason why i got into in, involved in all of this and why i ended up with my uh, neurodivergent diagnoses is that um I basically burnt myself out. I had a really serious burnout three years ago, um, autistic burnout that it, it turned out to be. And it was a kind of stuck in a cycle of, okay, you get the latest management book, you get the latest technique, you read up on that, you try it to get another higher level of performance out of yourself to cope in that system of work. And it would work for so long and then that cap coping mechanism would fail. So you'd move on to the next thing. I basically, at the age of 47, got to the point of I just completely burnt out from it. Um, and that was the start of my journey where I took six months mm. off, had CBT, and then got to the end of that. And where you know the therapist said, OK, maybe I'm just a suggestion here. Do some of the, uh, you know, you, the autism and ADHD tests and see what that turns out. Oh, OK. It turns out that you're actually very, very high on those initial kind of diagnosis and indicative tests. So that's when I went and engaged with my my GP and said, I think I'm autistic. I think I've got ADHD. And that started my journey. And that's why I'm involved with this. So number one, look after yourself, be aware of what you're capable of and be realistic. Uh, if you can get more people involved, brilliant. But as I say, you know, pick off more uh, uh, enough that what you can chew, basically. Um, as I said, you know, we I, I could do this 24-7. I absolutely love it. The organisation's not going to let me do that, unfortunately. But, you know, it's, as I said, it's, it's, it's a great, great role to do. What you just have to be is you're doing it for the enjoyment, not because you feel obliged. So th those would be my slightly random kind of words of advice. Thank you. Diane, can I just add that um, you said you have passion and that passion is an indication um, of, uh, of that you are cut out for this work in the sense like we need leaders who are passionate. We don't want leaders who tick a box. So when you have passion, that's half the job done. And I think you need to club it with uh, what Neil has said is it is that do you have the right people around you who can support you in the way you need the support? And um, so can that take pressure off you? Can you come together with a, a really good contracting in the sense like uh, what are our terms of working? You know, when one of us can't do it, you know, can how do we support each other? That discussions of open on and transparent discussions can need to happen earlier on, which means it creates the right kind of environment for the right leadership through to thrive. So it is possible with the right support and the right commitment to it. That, that, that there is a way, but you will figure it out, is what I'll say. It, it <laughs> seems daunting, but 
just spend time with people, talk to people, talk about your ideas and your feelings. Be be open and honest, because this is what you know. The, the I, I've always wanted about the the network. A lot of the things that are the challenges for individuals, you know, in life or or disability. The biggest biggest help I found is talking about it and being open and honest about things. And it's surprising how quickly and how much things change. Do we have any other questions? Sorry, I think we've uh, outrun today's session. I think that's it for questions. I think we've just got one final slide. Yeah, just. Just to let you know that if there, if we can be of any help, I'm, I'm sure the slides will be, um, you know, um, distributed. So if we can be of, of any help in any way, if you need um, to even float some ideas, we're there and this is our contact. So that's all. Um, that's what I'll end the session with. So I'll just stop sharing the screen. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And. Uh... Hope everyone has a, a cool... Uh...